Uh, well, hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Feriz Bilgin, I'm president of Rethink Institute. We have uh, two very distinguished guests all the way from Europe, uh, Sir Graham Watson and Mr. Sardar Yeshilmer. So please join me talking, uh, thanking them. So uh, I'm going to uh, start by introducing them. Uh, first with Sir Graham Watson. He is currently president of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe Party. Uh, he's uh, born and studied in Scotland. And before entering European Parliament in 1994, uh, Mr. Watson worked for the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation in their London and Hong Kong offices and at HSBC Bank. Uh, he was the first British Liberal Democrat ever to be declared elected to the European Parliament. And he continued representing Southwest England in the European Parliament until June of this year. From 94 to 99, uh, Mr. Watson was a member of the Com Committee for Economic and Monetary Affairs and Industrial Policy. Uh, from July 99 to 2002, he served as chairman of the Committee on Citizens' Freedoms and Rights. Um, in January 2002, he was elected as leader of the European Parliament's Liberal Democrat Group. Uh, during his tenure, the Liberal Group grew to become the largest ever third force in the European Parliament. And uh, he stood down from this role after the European election in June 2009 to return to the back benches. Uh, Mr. Watson was knighted in the Queen's birthday honors in October 2011. And in the same year, he was elected as the president of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe Party, known as ALDE, comprising 55 liberal parties from across Europe. And uh, I'm going to uh, start with a fun question, since you are a Scottish yeah. person. So how did you feel about all this Scottish commotion? <laughs> well, mm -hmm. you know, whenever things are not as good as they should be in Scotland, we try to blame it on the Americans. <laughs> and on this particular case, we picked a great American liberal called Woodrow Wilson, uh, who developed the theory of the self-determination of peoples. And it was a very useful theory, and it's ridded many people of their uh, oppressors over the years. Um, but whether Scotland was being oppressed by England is uh, an interesting point. And what a lot of people forget is that actually when Scotland and England joined forces, it happened in two stages. In 1603, the English didn't have a monarch, so they invited the King of Scotland to become King of England as well. And we had the Union of the Crowns. And then in 1707, there was a vote in the Scottish Parliament to unite the two parliaments. And it was on the basis of the Union of the Crowns and the Union of the Parliaments that Scotland and England together built an empire. And some would say that Scotland benefited more from the British Empire that England did, certainly Scotland was overrepresented in the management of that empire. But of course, empires rise and fall. And over the last hundred years, the British Empire has fallen and has been succeeded by the American Empire. Uh, great as it is today, in this, the world's most powerful country. And so people in Scotland have started asking the question, well, hang on, we don't have an empire any longer. Is this union with England still worthwhile? Well, by 55% to 45%, we decided it was. But that might not be the end of the story. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Very good. <laughs> All right. Well, our second guest is uh, Mr. Sardar Yeshilyurt. He was born in Istanbul, had his bachelor's degree at Bilkent University in Ankara with majors on political science and public administration. Mm -hmm. He has his master's degree from the same institution on political culture. Then he continued his studies at Hamburg University on European Studies. Uh, Mr. Yeshildjord is the founder and director of Tuscon's office in Brussels. And since 2006, he represents the Turkish business community in the EU. 
Uh, he is a regular commentator on general EU issues and economy of Europe in Turkish TV channels. Thank you for coming. Um, I have several questions for both of you, and uh, let's go back to uh, Mr. Watson again. You are uh, the president of uh, the Alliance for Liberals and Democrats. Uh, so tell us about these liberal democrats in the European or in the European context. Uh, what do they stand for? What do they defend? What is their platform? Well, th thank you very much, uh, Pepsi, for offering me the opportunity because I always tread very cautiously when I come this side of the Atlantic, <laughs> when I say I'm a liberal. Because I know that to be a liberal is to be a kind of dangerous radical. Um, in Europe, the liberal philosophy grew, really, in the first place with the French Revolution, followed by the American Revolution, all about the rights and the dignity of the human being. And it was added to by ideas of economic freedom developed by Adam Smith from my country and by others and very much further developed by the ideas of social liberalism, developed partly in Europe, but partly on this side of the Atlantic as well by people like John Rawls uh, and uh, John Kenneth Galbraith and others. And if you look at what liberal Democrats stand for in Europe at the moment, and we are only the third party, we stand for not a middle way between conservatism and socialism, or between Christian democracy and socialism, uh, as it would be on the continent of Europe. But we stand for a belief in the liberal democratic state and the fundamentals of the rule of law, combined with a sense of exploration, innovation, education to try to help people make the most of their lives. And although many people see liberal Democrats as kind of the halfway choice between the right and the left, we don't see ourselves in that way. We see ourselves as the radicals for freedom. And if you were to look at liberal campaigns at the moment in the European Union, what would they consist of? Well, they would be campaigns, for example, for bringing in refugees with a proper refugee policy because it not only boosts human understanding but it boosts freedom. Difficult line to argue in Europe. We would be the people who stand for our homosexual rights, the rights of homosexuals to marry and to adopt children. Very difficult line to argue in some of the states of the European Union. We would be the people who believe in internet freedom and the rights to experiment on the internet. We don't see the development of electronic te technology as a threat, we see it as an opportunity, if combined with proper data protection. Those are the kind of things that we stand for. So it's, can we say it's kind of closer to Democrats than Republicans? Yes. I think in most states of the USA, it would be closer to the Democrats than the Republicans. I think there was a time when there was a stronger liberal wing in the Republican Party. It's hard for me to judge from my side of the pond, but the only things we read about the Republican Party in our newspapers about how it's been taken over by the Tea Party. Mm -hmm. That's right. Actually, uh, coming to that, uh, my next question was about your opinion on transatlantic relations, basically, you know, both sides of the ocean, Atlantic. Uh, how do you see that? cooperation or the alliance goes vis-a-vis -vis the new rising challenges such as like Russia's ambitions in, in Eastern Europe? That's a, that's a very pertinent question because I must be honest with you, I'm, I'm actually worried about transatlantic relations. If, if you look at what, at the way the world is organized at the moment, we have the single most successful relationship that you can find between any two regions of the world. We have the biggest trading relationship. We have the biggest mutual investment relationship. We have the greatest degree of people-to-people -people exchange that you can possibly imagine. And if you talk to leaders of the United States of America, dare I even say of NAFTA, 
If you talk to leaders of the European Union, they will say, well, our relationship with North America is good because we share the same values. But when you actually come down to analyze this, I think it's true we share the same values, but I'm not sure that we interpret them in the same ways. And my experience of having done 20 years in the European Parliament is that actually we miss a lot of dialogue. We think that dialogue is unnecessary between Western Europe and North America because we think, well, we all share the same values. Actually, we don't, and we need dialogue to identify where those differences are and to work through them. Otherwise, we have not a snowball's chance in hell of reaching agreement on a transatlantic trade and investment partnership, which I am convinced would be hugely beneficial to all of us. All right. Well, Mr. Yashidur, uh, would you talk about your activities in Brussels as a representative of TUSCOM, which is a moniker for Confederation of Turkish Industrials and the Confederation of Businessmen and Industrials Business of Turkey. Of Turkey, yes. So we don't we don't say Turkish, the Turkish and others. All of Turkey, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> we are we are trying to get. So some. how is your presence perceived in Brussels, and 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 uh, what, again, what is your uh, what is your platform there? Yeah, um, maybe I should start with I mean, what does EU mean for Turkey? Because mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it at the beginning of the century. There was a tremendous uh, energy in Turkey towards the EU, and we have been a part. SCOM was founded late 2005. I was assigned to, to establish our Brussels office it, it, at the first page of our uh, confederation. So in Turkey, you establish a book uh, for the foundation of an association, according to law, and in the first page it says, this is, this is the president, vice president, these are the founders, and if the tenant item there, was nominating me as uh, to open up. This shows how, how important it was. And indeed, um, we, we had a very nice start, and it, we had very bright days, not just in terms of our Turkey relation, but in the uh, transformation of Turkey, uh, how we call it is Europeanization of Turkey. That was what we, we stand for in, in Brussels. Of course, we were uh, very much support to, to, to our uh, membership bid and uh, to the continuity of negotiations, which we have seen as a very important leverage for Turkey's Europeanization. Um, we, how we did it was, I mean, because since our members are not directly that much uh, affected by the regulations in the EU, maybe slightly and quite indirectly, they have been uh, through regulations like REACH, the chemicals, uh, identification of chemicals, etc. Uh, mostly we tried to uh, promote our national interest and national economy. That was what we had focused our uh, organizations, events, and everything. Yes. We have a video between two up to 14 events with different organizations in Brussels. Uh, mostly panels, conferences on Turkey related issues, but um, Turkey and the regions which covers the neighborhood policy of Europe. Uh, North Africa, uh, East, Eastern Europe, now uh, Russia, and also, of course, the Middle East, but also internal debates to Turkey. What we try to focus on is to bring Turkish agenda up, uh, up into the uh, Brussels, which is, to be honest, very hard for the last three years, and even getting uh, harder and harder uh, since, let's say, 15, 16 months after what has happened in Gezi Park in, in, in Istanbul. Uh, that has been the focus. Well, I may say we have been quite successful at the beginning, but uh, if, I, if we could really um, uh, measure the impact of what we do in Brussels, I would say we are really uh, down in somewhere in the graphic, uh, because uh, what's happening in Turkey is definitely not helping mm -hmm. Turkey's image. And whatever we do uh, is just trying to bring the right information from Turkey through our members, which is exceeding 55,000 uh, all around Turkey, to Brussels and to help to help our friends in Europe to to understand the situation better. Uh, of course, I mean th these were mostly on the on the political side, on the economic side. Of course, our office has been uh, very operative on, on creating business links between European and Turkish companies, not just bilateral relations, but uh, also uh, for the national and third countries, mainly the, again the neighborhood, but wider neighborhood, which includes sub-Saharan Africa. Um, 
our success there, there is quite limited because of the basically post 2007 crisis in Europe. But it is opening up. If if things can turn into normal in Turkey, I'm sure there will be plenty of opportunities to go bring up the economic energy in Europe and, and, and Turkey, and also to find the opportunities in the third markets with the entrepreneurship uh, soul from the Turkish side and also financial, technical, and uh, added value advantage of the European companies. Quite connected, basically. Yeah, we, we, we try to do uh -huh. yes. So speaking of Turkey, uh, Mr. Watson, you're also a member of Friends of Turkey Parliamentary Group, and, and you have a keen interest in Turkey. Um, so how do you interpret generally the latest political developments for, for the latest, let's say, 12 to 15 months that's a general question. I'll have more detailed questions. Well, I'm, just I'm, to get your hunch. Yeah. I'm I'm very proud that it was under a British presidency of the European Union back ten years ago that the European Union decided to offer Turkey the perspective of membership of the European Union, and we opened negotiations to that point. Uh, those negotiations have been dragging on now for 10 years and we're getting nowhere fast. It's like wading through treacle. Um, why is this? Well, it's partly because some member states of the European Union never really fully shared the majority view that Turkey could become a member of the European Union. And it's partly because some member states are worried about public opinion Public opinion, which 20 or 30 years ago, nobody would have doubted that Turkey was part of Europe, but which as a result of the increasing radicalization of Islam on the one side and of Christianity on the other, has led to a sense of conflict. And governments, particularly the German government and the French government, don't want to take on their own people on an issue like that. At the moment, we're in an impasse. Why are we in an impasse? Well, number one, because I would say the Turkish revolution has gone wrong. Mr. Erdogan, who started out as a great liberal social reformer, appears to be becoming uh, a rather intolerant, um, monopolistic, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say dictatorial because that's too strong a word, but there are things that suggest that it might be moving in that direction. So there's a worry about how deeply rooted in the idea of constitutions and the rule of law uh, current Turkey is. At the same time, in Europe, you have the European People's Party, which is the largest political party on our continent, has decided that no, now is not the right time to make further progress with Turkey. And they say we need Turkey as a strategic partner, but suggesting that you can't become one of us. And that is the situation in which we find ourselves. It's a difficult one. My own view is that the political logic in economic terms, in security terms, in demographic terms, in just about any field you like to imagine, the political logic is that Turkey and the European Union have to come closer together, and Turkey will one day be a member of the European Union. But the current situation in which we find ourselves does not suggest any obvious road forward. Yeah, and uh, you have written a letter to the Economist in January after the corruption scandal erupted in, in December, and there you wrote, I quote, the country's corruption scandal is fast undermining confidence in Turkish democracy at home and abroad. A referendum in 2010 found 58% of Turkish voters in favor of a new civilian constitution. It has not yet been drafted. The impressive energy behind a 10-year reform process has evaporated. A new, author new authoritarianism can be seen in the government's relations with business, the media, and towards protest. So this is pretty early call, basically, and, and, and quite precise, it seems to me. Do you think that Turkish government gave heed to these concerns later on, after the uh, 
after January or? No, I'm, I'm worried that if anything, things have continued to deteriorate. Yeah. And I mean, it's always hard to put one's finger on the point at which people's views started changing. But if I had to put my finger on the most important determinant of today's situation, it would be Mr. Erdogan's reaction uh, last December to the corruption allegations that were leveled at those around him. And the kind of, well, his use of the term parallel state towards many of Turkey's liberals who believe in the rule of law and believe that nobody should be above the rule of law, whatever office they hold. Uh, and that, I think, is, is making life difficult at the moment. Indeed, uh, I would say that at a time when we really need to be working much more closely together, given the situation in Ukraine and given the situation in Syria and Iraq, at a time when Turkey desperately needs solidarity from other European countries with another 130,000 refugees coming across the border uh, in, 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 in recent days. Uh, we are actually drifting further apart, and I see that as a danger, both for Turkey and for the European Union. Right. And, and in connection to that, in the same letter, you uh, mentioned that allegations of a foreign plot blamed on his former reformist allies in the Gulen movement allow Mr. Erdogan to paint himself as a victim rather than a villain. Uh, now, my question is, some in Washington thought that this this was all a power struggle between the Gulen movement and uh, Erdogan or AKP. It seems that you disagree with that notion. Uh, how do you see this whole thing uh, uh, between, I mean, the, the basically Erdogan's obsession with, uh, with the Gulen movement and the characterization of it in the context of this uh, political and corruption scam? I don't see it as a power struggle because I don't see the Gulen movement trying to use power against Mr. Erdogan. I think he is trying to use his power against the Gulen movement. But uh, I don't uh, say that. And, and what I, how I would characterize it is more the actions of somebody who has arguably been in power too long, who has become arrogant and has become fleet of foot with the niceties of democracy. And uh, that is, I think, a danger for Turkey. I regret it particularly because so much progress has been made in other terms under Erdogan and his government. I mean, look at Turkey today and compare it to Turkey 10, 15 years ago. Look at the schools and the hospitals. Look at the education levels of the people. You know, there, there, are, there are three things needed for success these days, the so-called three Ts talent, technology, and tolerance. Tolerance is suddenly lacking in Turkey. I, when I put together my uh, book, Building a Liberal Europe, there's even a picture there in that book of Mr. Erdogan lining up alongside Europe's liberal prime ministers because he saw himself back in 2004 as being in Europe's liberal cap. Couldn't imagine it happening today. How would you see it? Is this, uh, Mr. Yeshilu, this is the, the argument that is that the whole crisis is about the power struggle between the two. Uh, how would you answer to that? I would say yes, there's a power struggle, but I think the elements being named are, are, are quite different. I think there's a power struggle uh, of old mentality of Turkey with uh, uh, possibly a more um, uh, consolidated Turkey. I mean, I guess everyone at my age who lived through 28 uh, February in Turkey uh, was hoping for an opening up, not just politically but also socially in Turkey, which has happened. But then the same power which made it happen has suddenly changed mind and had been captured by the previous enemies and turned, in, turned back the history. Uh, so I think there's a struggle, yes, and the struggle is not a new one. 
and it will continue because democracy needs democrats. And unless we have enough democrats, we will never have a real democracy. So uh, there will be people who will use the notions in democracy for their own sake. Uh, when this technology was used back in 2006 to 2007 in Brussels, uh, I was always uh, quite uh, not happy with, with that because it was all against what we were asking for. Because we were really truly believing that every single individual should enjoy the same rights and the freedoms in our country, happily, culturally, educationally. That was our position back, to, back in 2007. And we were hoping that the political elite was also for that, which bring, brought us together for some time, but then it changed. So indeed that old ghost is still haunting us and it's still there. We have just dreamed that it was gone, but it came back very easily because the institutions are never there. That was, I think the biggest failure of all this social transformation was back in 2011, just after 2010, just after the referenda, uh, the request for a new constitution was at stop. And we should really push for the negotiation to start before the election because all the leaders have promised for that. And that was the biggest failure in our social transaction, social transformation, if, even they can call it as metamorphosis. And the failure has brought us to the back old days. I mean, I can. Since I, I can remember it very, very concretely, I can easily compare what's happening today with uh, 97, 1997, 1998, 1999. More or less the same story. So the struggle is there, but I mean, to, to name it as uh, a fight against the Gulag movement, Canada state, I think is the rhetoric of, of the government, which makes them very easy to, to hide all these discussions, that they are just uh, trying to. Uh, make the history run backwards, which never happens. And once you open the box, you cannot close it back. And uh, Turkish people, I think, have already tested uh, and tasted also uh, the limits of uh, freedom. And it cannot be returned back. Whomever tries it may try it for some more time. But what we have seen in, in, in human history, that it cannot work that way. You can put some pressure on for some time, for limited purposes, with some wealth and prosperity. But in a country like Turkey, which has to be open and add value and, and be a part of the uh, world economy in order to prosper, in order to continue to live, uh, cannot close up. And uh, basing on that, uh, I think that struggle will eventually turn into uh, a win for whoever wants uh, an open society in Turkey, whoever wants uh, a real democracy, functioning with functioning real institutions uh, without any arbitrary rulings of the leaders. And uh, uh, if I may add to, uh, to uh, basically uh, situation, especially in the, in the business community in Turkey, vis-a-vis -vis what you have mm -hmm. said. So now you're representing an organization that represents business community in, in Turkey. And, and for the business to expand, they need a sphere uh, that is not interfered by government. Yes, they would need rule of law. They would need predictability. Uh, so, how does the business community feel about the latest political situation? Yeah, it is. It is. I, mean, I think it's an easy, easy answer. It's hurting. Mm. Uh, it's not just. I mean, what is happening? What is not happening is also hurting because Turkey. Uh, we have survived through the crisis. Okay, but how we survived was through uh, too much painkillers. I mean, construction sector is a painkiller for economic growth. You use it whenever it's necessary. It helps you. But if there's a cure on the other side, it helps you. But you know, after tasting the huge amounts of profit in the construction sector, the boost of the sector has been used as a, uh, as a sort of a, a source of, a, uh, if I may call it, a rentier state. You know, Turkey is not a rentier state, cannot be because you don't have this uh, rich uh, resources, oil or gas. But interestingly, uh, because uh, all the uh, profit maximization comes from legal decision making in the construction sector, because you can easily change legislation and make uh, a land worth 10 times more. It is the magic uh, in the hands of the politicians. So the politicians started to use, uh, at municipal level, but also at the national level, the construction uh, sector as a as a source of uh, rentier economy. And unfortunately, this has really changed the motivations of the industry. And uh, we 
have seen that even in between our members, we have fought against it very, very harshly in, in, as an organization, uh, uh, taking the profits out, out of the industry and putting it into, into construction sector. Because I mean, you can employ, let's say, 7,000 people at a, at a cutting factory in Marash, and you could yearly get a maximum $80 million profit. That's most you can get out of it. But you could easily buy a land and make a good promise with the, uh, with the local mayor, and, and if necessary, if it's in Istanbul, especially with the prime minister uh, of that time. Uh, and uh, you could uh, earn something like 500 or 1 million in a year time with less investment. Of and we have seen, I mean, the, the investment Vesta did, uh, Zorlu Group did in Istanbul, I think was the end of an era in Turkey, because Vesta is the only trademark in electronics in Turkey, which is known worldwide. And it has been very successful. And we have seen that after they have taken a very huge decision after 2009, they have bought an enormous land in near Bosphorus, and they invested some $3 billion, which would turn into enormous um, R&D facility and also um, uh, uh, different products uh, in, in their facilities as, as the company does that, but turned into a very ugly building in Bosphorus one of the ugliest ever, because it was just maximization of the land. Uh, and they, get, they, they, they earned a lot, I'm sure, but it killed their uh, company, and it, it killed their competitiveness, because it's also very hard to find money in Turkey, because our savings at the 12th first time, it's the lowest ever uh, in the world. So people, Turkish people do not save money. So that if, for an industry, if you want to have money for uh, investment, you have to find it outside of Turkey, or the bank you, you ask for should find it through syndication credits from outside of the country. So that is also hurting the economy, but that was already on the, on the stage. And in addition to all these uh, problems of a, a classical uh, $10,000 economy, uh, all these, uh, I may call it as ugly business, ugly politics of the uh, last two years is making things much more harder. I mean. If there hadn't been that nationalistic and that patriotic feelings in Turkey, a racial decision maker would say, let's get out of this country. Because to do business in Turkey is like uh, walking on a broken glass. You cannot know it if it will fall down or if it will, it will cut your foot. And you don't know when it can happen because the rule of law is not there. You cannot trust. So that's why the, uh, the uh, people are making contracts which uh, with do you, do you, um, commitments to Swiss course or etc. Because the trustability is not there. And the predictability, okay, there's a long serving government, but there's always things coming up. Every single day you hear, uh, today we have heard that there are 130,000 new refugees. What does it refer to? I think you have done an investment in, in Urfa. For a business person, this is one of the biggest unpredictable that you can have. 130,000 people who are poor and who are in need, and they are coming to city where your investment is there. So these are all adding quite big burdens for investment in Turkey, which needs that investment and that employment to grow, but also to, uh, to, to continue to stability. So it is definitely not working for the good of Turkey, and this trend will definitely take the money out. And uh, I don't know how Turkey, Turkey is, uh, can, can turn the wheel, because uh, all what I say would, would uh, uh, I, I want to bind it up with one sentence from Deputy Prime Minister Mr. Babajan, who said just three weeks ago that Turkey has to find uh, something uh, around $220 billion in just one year time. So these are mostly to renew the credits for the private sector, but also public sector. And $220 billion is a huge money. Limits huge. What's their plan? Um, I'm sure everyone, every private sector has its plan, but mm -hmm. you can find it. I mean, if, if, you, if you pay enough interest, you can find money every time. But the problem is that can industry or can whatever the sector is, mm -hmm. can they really earn that added value? It's not possible. So if a, how can you expect a business person to continue to do business if they can not even pay their debts? Mm -hmm. So possibly for many business uh, owners, it will be, let's be smaller. Let's, let's not continue. And if Turkey cannot grow, uh, we know that, I mean, statistically, if you grow 2.4%, we cannot feed the need for an employment, for newcomers to the workforce. So if we fall beyond that, 
it means we are in negative growth. Mm. So that, that's why the numbers in Turkey are most of the time uh, not not so uh, comparatively right with, with European growth. I mean, but three percent in Germany, people uh, can shop up. They have the right, but in three percent Turkey is more or less um, a moderate level of growth. Mm. Right. Okay. Well, here's a question for both of you. Um, after Erdogan's election as president in August 2000, uh, this year, uh, Turkey entered a de facto presidential system without making necessary constitutional changes. So do you think this system will work? That's adding to your predictability question. But do you think that this system will work? Well, I, I hope the judges at whatever Turkey's equivalent of the constitutional court is will be very, very tough. Uh, on any attempt to arrogate powers to the presidency, which should more rightfully, according to the Constitution, be exercised by Prime Minister and his cabinet and parliament. Uh, and I think that is the, you know, the real lesson of history is that the countries that succeed are countries which combine continued freedom with social development. And uh, it seems to me that this is essential in Turkey. You know, if you look at the way we're going in the world, Turkey and Europe are in a bad place. The, the contours of globalization are being sketched not in Istanbul or in Brussels. They're being sketched in the computer campuses of West Coast America, in the coal centers of India, in the factories of China. We need to come together if we are going to survive and compete. And we need to marry our talents and our investment capabilities uh, to make sure that Europe still has a voice uh, in the rest of this century. Are you suggesting Turkey is already old Turkey? How old are Europe part of? <laughs> Turkey, in, in demographic terms, Turkey is better off than the rest of Europe. Yeah. But it's not that much better off. Mm -hmm. And it needs the markets and the investment and the shared sense of, you know, let's face it, Turkey is, is part of, of Europe. I mean, any historical view of this would have seen Turkey as one of the Axis powers in the First World War. Going further back, they saw uh, Istanbul or Constantinople as it was then known, being the place of refuge for European intellectuals who were being persecuted by the uh, Catholic Reformation uh, and, and, and by the Catholic Inquisition uh, and so on. And, and I think that just as our history has lain together, our future has to lie together. Uh, and you know, that's, that's, we, we, we have to move from where we are uh, to there. And it does involve us recognizing the power of inclusiveness and the beauty of diversity. Yeah, uh, I'd say I hope it doesn't happen. I mean, it, of course, the president is willing to take over. The constitution doesn't land it. Uh, so if you are going to perform as a rule of law state, where a rule of law still functions, if, if all these written things have as a meaning, it will never happen. But I mean, what's happening, if, if you look at on, on real, if you are a realist and if you, are, if you want to read political science through what's going on on the field, I'd say yes, it will turn into a presidential system eventually. Because whatever he has done in the last nine months, I cannot follow it in, in, in between our lines uh, in the Turkish goal. Uh, so the political force in Turkey, of course, everybody has their egos. Are they still going to follow the president, uh, whatever tells them? We will, we will see how it will. I hope it doesn't, because Turkey and presidential system, what kind of a presidential system, mm -hmm. nobody knows about it. Nobody knows what the presidential system is about. I mean, even the people who are talking about uh, changing into a presidential system, they are describing the American uh, way of presidency as, uh, as if a president can do whatever he wants in this country. You know, he cannot even do very small things, which uh, one, of, one of one advisor of the prime minister, then prime minister Erdogan, said that it's a big weakness that it was about to shut down last year. You remember? I mean, Turkey, nobody can do it against the will of the prime minister, but here it does. So it's checks and balances. In the presidential system they have in mind is 
without any checks and balances system, which they can do whatever they want. I hope it, it never happens, but the threat is there because there's a big political will, uh, because people basically see that they prosper and they're afraid that if things change, that may really bring uh, big questions. Uh, but political dynamics are, are varying a lot, and what's happening in our south, what's happening in our north, and it will have its impact on, on Turkey, and this, for me, uh, unsustainable system will really come to uh, a position that people have to decide uh, on their votes uh, about what kind of a future they want. Uh, and we have different uh, possibilities. I mean, we can be uh, a country like our northern neighbor, our eastern neighbors, the other side of the uh, Caspian Sea especially, or our southern neighbors, if they are willing to do so, or our western neighbors. And they have all their own path. So Turkey has to decide and to walk through that. And you, you cannot make an a carte menu. It doesn't. It doesn't. Oh, they, there's not not such an offer. You have to take one of the menus and walk through that. And this presidential thing, especially making it a de facto presidential system, is never in line with what we have been asking the Europeanization, which has been the goal of the state, not the government, for at least two centuries uh, in Turkey. We pray that it doesn't happen, but if it happens, I'm sure that, that there are uh, social uh, forces in Turkey uh, who, who are willing for a real democracy, would fight not that to happen, fight in terms of, of course, a, a social and political fight, mm -hmm. never on the field. Right. And uh, my last question to Mr. Watson, and after that we can we'll open the floor to discussion. We are getting questions from the audience. So you're... Uh, you're one of the leaders in European political uh, circle, and uh, you have already mentioned uh, some of the things about you know, the destiny of Turkey with Europe or Europe destiny with Turkey. Um, so it always comes down to the question of the chance of Turkey becoming, what is the chance of Turkey as yes, becoming a member of the European Union? And the last formation, uh, the Davutoglu government, they actually selected the foreign policy uh, actors who are very close to European uh, or knowing in European circles. So that's from what they have. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we had these remarks uh, from, from Erdogan and or from his lieutenants about uh, Turkey's desire to be a member of the Eurasian Union. Uh, or, or, or Shanghai cooperation, things like that. Uh, there is always a question whether Turkey's axis is shifting to east and so on. But it seems that it may shift to far east. So uh, as, a, as a European leader, uh, how do you feel about all these things? I mean, what do you guys talk between <laughs> yourselves in Brussels, you know, when you hear such things coming from Ankara? Well, I, I think we, sh we should never criticize Turkey mm -hmm. for looking at all of its options. Mm -hmm. You know, every country has to do this. And I see some of the talk that Mr. Erdogan has used about joining the Eurasian Union partly as a response to some of the rather hostile voices mm -hmm. that are coming from within the European Union towards Turkey. And I think that Erdogan is right, as anybody in his government would be, to say, well, to the European Union, well, look, guys, if you don't want us, we have other options. I don't actually believe those other options are very credible uh, in the short term. They might be in the medium to long term if Turkey's orientation were to shift. Uh, I think actually in the short term we're there. But, you know, dem democracies are, are run by, by crisis management. Serious problems are not tackled until they have to be tackled. You know, the time is coming for us to tackle some of the serious problems that we have in Cyprus, in the rule of law in Turkey, but also in uh, attitudes within the European Union and, and things together. So, I'm I'm actually I'm actually optimistic in the medium term. What I don't see is where the political opposition comes, the democratic political opposition comes within Turkey to Mr. Erdogan's AK Party. I don't, 
I, I had hoped that you know perhaps the CHP uh, would reform, would recognize what the Erdogan revolution has achieved, and set itself up as a party that offered an alternative within the new scenario, or that some new political party would emerge which would offer. Now, it may be that the AK party itself will, be, will divide into two different movements. It could be. But we must not allow a situation where a party which was a broad-based liberal and conservative movement allows itself to be dragged off to a kind of intolerant right-wing position simply because its leader has been in office for too long. Right. Well, thank you very much. So we are ready for your questions. I guess I'm the senior member here mm -hmm. in this august uh, audience. Uh, I very much enjoyed your presentation, both of you. My daughter attended and graduated from Bilken University, Sinde. In fact, you may have been a colleague of hers, judging by your age. but. Mm -hmm. uh, I very much agree with uh, what has been said at the forum. I'm a member of the executive committee of the American Turkish Council, and I lived uh, eight, seven, eight years of my adult life in uh, Turkey, so both as a businessman and as a senior military officer, so I can readily identify with many of the things uh, Mr. Watson has said, including uh, the transatlantic uh, uh, trade and investment partnership which has been proposed and which I firmly believe would help enhance Turkey's chances towards ultimate uh, yeah. accession to the European Union. Uh, that said, uh, the present crisis in Syria and the region uh, does not bode well for any expedited negotiations. I'm optimistic. Uh, Secretary Kerry and Secretary uh, Hagel have been recently in Turkey. Uh, certainly Turkey's geostrategic uh, importance has been enhanced by this crisis. Uh, and anyone who watches BBC News in the morning, as I do, 6 a.m. to 8 a.m., is really concerned about what's happening with the Kurdish population coming across the border. Um, I'm encouraged that Secretary of Commerce Pritzker will be traveling to Turkey with a group of CEOs from America. Um, I'm also encouraged our Chairman, General James Jones, will be traveling and uh, hoping to calm the waters and breaking bread with uh, Erdo er er Erdogan and his uh, inner circle in the near future. But um, things, things between the U.S. and Turkey, I don't know. I, I agree with Mr. Watson. There's a great divergence and there has to be a convergence of our policies because, I mean, my daughter who lived with me in Turkey and my wife who was a professor at Bill Kent, uh, all her Turkish friends in Manhattan, they read the New York Times and Mr. Erdogan can say whatever he wants to his domestic audiences, but if the New York Times doesn't buy it, those overseas journalists don't buy it. And right now, threatening New York Times journalists who live in Ankara, that is not a smart policy. Same for the Washington Post. I mean, really, God, things have got to calm down because there is an eminent crisis, an eminent crisis that has to be dealt with, if for no other reason than humanitarian, uh, humanitarian uh, reasons. My question, which I finally got around to, to help these young people behind me kind of get their <laughs> mental juices going, 
My question, since I'm a businessman now, and I have in the past frequently traveled to Turkey, um, which has been my primary orientation, but um, I'm really interested in how the European Parliament might look on Secretary Kerry's rather vague statement welcoming Iran into the equation. I mean, that doesn't sit well with me, but I'd be interested in what you have to say, Mr. Watson. I, I, I that's, well, can, can, I, can I break all the rules of politics and give you a completely honest answer? My own view is actually Iran is part of the equation and needs to be, and I think we need to drop some of the um, rather harsh rhetoric we have used towards the Iranians and some of the double standards we have applied. But let's face it, uh, Britain and America helped India ride a coach and horses through the non-proliferation treaty as soon as we feared that Pakistan had a bomb. We treated Iran completely different. So I think, you know, we've, we've, got, we've got to look at this. I actually do think Iran, being one of the great civilizations of the Middle East, one of the great powers, has to be brought back into the international community, and I think that it might help matters to do so. Moreover, I know that Secretary Kerry and Secretary Clinton before him, and uh, Baroness Ashton, who's the European Union's foreign policy supremo, have worked quite closely together here, and Baroness Ashton has been to Iran and had talks with their foreign minister and things. There is there is some some movement there, and I'm not sure that, that Turkey should fear that in any way. Indeed, I believe Turkey may be able to be helpful. We desperately need stability in the Middle East. We are not getting it from the Gulf states, who are the ones who are funding all of the various fighting forces in the countries around them. And uh, it may be that we need to look to Iran. But, you know, don't listen to me, as, as Emre Celik at the back will tell you, because in many ways he's an Australian. You know, if, if the sun never set on the British Empire, it was because God would never trust the English in the dark. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. In your opinion, what is the alternative for Turkey in regards to TTIP? As Turkey is not a part of the European Union, it must be a part of the negotiations between the uh, United States and Europe in that regard. So what can Turkey do and how, uh, it's position how can it be positioned in this uh, situation? Sir, that looks really well okay. for you. Uh, the issue with TTIP is, is a long story. First, we should start from customs union, which is the indeed de facto agreement between Turkey and EU, which makes Turkey partially a part of the customs union of EU, which was signed in 1996, which helped a lot, but it's an out-of-date agreement. Uh, there has been several attempts to change this customs union agreement into a real uh, FTA of nowadays, a, a second or they now even call it third uh, generation FTA, which failed because there is no trust between the institutions. Turkish side is trying to protect. It's a long story. But now there's a there's a close thread of TTIP, which will basically, uh, to to make it sh uh, short, the U.S. products will be able to come to Turkey freely, whereas Turkish products will be a third country, so we'll not be able to to go to U.S. It's not just that we are also being. Uh, cited by uh, one of the biggest uh, coming together of the history and Turkey is being left aside even though being in customs. Do we have much choices now? Our only, I think, uh, gambling uh, of the government is that either it's, it, it never happens uh, or it becomes a very lousy and low-level agreement, which is a possibility, or as the U.S. Uh, is trying to put forward an open architecture in TPP, uh, uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, which is also uh, time-wise uh, 
parallel to, to Chichen. And there's an open uh, architecture there. It, it's a, this is still a sidelined uh, issue. They don't talk about it. But the Americans, I mean, talk to them, they say that uh, the architecture will, will look like each other. So if there is, there is such an open architecture, Turkey may later, uh, when things go normal in the country, when Turkey again turns into being a real live ally, uh, may sign an agreement and may join at an agreement which Turkey has never appeared on the on the table, so none of the real uh, interest of Turkey was was there. But at least we can uh, how, how to decrease the losses. That's uh, we can stop the loss of blood. That that is the only way. Um, besides that, I mean, I don't really. I wouldn't really put my money on having a Turkey-U.S. FTA. It, it will never happen it's, it's under such uh, conditions. Uh, and especially what's happening now, I cannot even dream that Congress will come together and vote for something positive for Turkey, mm. especially when, when, it, when it will uh, be uh, an FTA. <coughs> it's South Korea it took more than five years even to, to pass it through, which was a much more simpler one. So. Uh, there is only one one thing. I mean, we are going to uh, pray for an open architecture, which is, I think, the clever way of doing it. Because it's not just Turkey; it's Switzerland, it's Norway, it's uh, it is partly, if we if we may call it, uh, Morocco, and here it's Mexico. With Canada, Europe, I don't know where the FTA leads to. So there are other countries who are also being sidelined, that they are also willing to be a part of the deal. We are all, I mean, in, in Brussels, we, we know each other, we, we attend to each other's events, and we are trying to follow it up all together. So all these countries are asking, asking for an open architecture where they can be a part of. If this happens, then we can be a part of that deal. If not, uh, we were stuck into a very uh, nasty position, which will somehow cost us $20 million. Uh, and these are first estimates. I'm sure if you, if you include indirect impact, it will be even bigger. And we will definitely lose our uh, competition in Europe. Some advantages, competition wise, some advantages in Europe to to US market too. So, I mean, uh, we can talk long, long about it, but mm -hmm. the issue is that Turkey does not have many options. Uh, I, I, you can read many articles where there are options like Turkey and US FTA. You know, it, it cannot have it. You are living in the US. Can, can you really think that? U.S. would really put an energy on signing an FTA with Turkey. No, cannot. Um, the only way is open architecture in Turkey being about signing it. Okay, well, I don't see any other hands, so that concludes our event. Okay, thank you very much for coming, and have a nice day.